Long across the open sea, hidden in the depths of the unknown, sits a mysterious island at the edge of the world, a refuge from the dying land that is the old continent of Gakane. We know it as Tear for D. Unmistakable with its otherworldly vistas, inhabitants, and laws of nature. It's a land whose history and lore is largely unknown, perhaps lost in time, or closely guarded by its native societies, the Echt for D. At its heart sits the fiery soul of the island, a volcano central to the myths, legends, and traditions of the indigenous islanders. This central volcano formed the island in an age as old as time itself, giving birth to the legend of a deity that the locals believe has an innate connection with the earth and the life it yields. Not far from the fiery soul sits a rock formation formed long ago by the volcano's fires, beyond the teeth of the sky. The native peoples call this place the doors of the heart, or the heart's gate. It is said that beyond the gate, the volcano hides an ancient sanctuary only accessible to those who prove themselves worthy of discovering the island's true spirit. Between these magnificent formations lies a village in which the local tribes meet to elect their high king. Beyond politics, this village houses only the most dedicated of the sanctuary's defenders, the guardians of the heart. The village is named Door of Renewal. For those who seek to visit the fiery soul and what lies within, must complete a series of rituals and traditions to reveal one's intent and gather the knowledge they need to connect with Tear for D, renewing themselves as a Denegad. The Donegada are wise men and women who practice healing, lore keeping, and the preservation of nature. These rituals take place in mysterious places of power, either formed by nature itself or built by the most ancient ancestors of the indigenous folk. It is said that upon completing each ritual, one can be presented the opportunity to meet face to face with a god. A god who is believed to serve as the protector of the island that ensures that all beings live in harmony with one another. The islander traditions are almost as time-worn as one of the island's most venerable inhabitants, none other than the ancient trees painted across the terrain whose roots weave together to create the lifeblood of the island's magical character that the natives undoubtedly recognize as they incorporate their rituals into the network of roots. Taller than any across the known world, Tear for D's trees demonstrate the otherworldly nature of the island's wilderness, and beneath its canopies lie fauna aplenty, that play just as equal a role as the flora in the island's ecosystem and enchanting spirit. It is believed that the island itself provides for the inhabitants who respect its divinity by providing all that one may need to survive its climate. To celebrate this divinity, the natives organize great hunts to find only the rarest creatures the island bestows upon them. The heart of this activity lies within the village of the Shadow Spirits clan, where all great hunts are organized and initiated from as hunters young and old set forth on the hunt by completing an interesting role-playing ritual in which one participant acts as a great white andrig while the rest are meant to find and give chase. Upon finding this great white andrig, hunters are granted a bountiful harvest with ample game throughout the coming year. While hunting is important to the native populace, some prefer a more quiet and harmonious life, living in accord with all the life around them. In the rocky steppes sits a village, the Water of the Summit, belonging to the Windweavers clan, a society dedicated to perfecting spirituality, meditation, and fabric weaving or the clan of healers and fishermen who live near the singing waters, using the plants that grow along the riverbanks to heal and treat sickness, earning them the name the River Healers. While their lifestyle is much different to that of the other clans, each and every native of Tear for D recognize and respect the magical properties of the land in which they live. They all share the same language, the same traditions, the same rituals, the same power structure, and the same potential to harness the island's power. Those who represent the natives are called Mao, or chiefs. Generally, the position of a chief is inherited and is a role that comes with the expectation of strong leadership skills and the ability to protect the clan at all costs. While the chief is paramount to a clan, the Denegad is an extremely important asset to any clan. 
as they are the direct bridge from the native peoples to the power one can harness from the island. Oftentimes, a chief and a Denegad are one and the same. The Danegada, however, are not necessarily a direct subordinate to a clan's chief. There is one role that supersedes even the high king or queen, and that is the Tierna Hach Kadaktis, or the Mistress of Wisdom. This mistress is chosen by the Danegada to represent the pinnacle of spirituality amongst the native people. She is said to be the wisest woman on the island, knowing all secrets, history, and lore passed down from generation to generation through paintings, reportedly a secret language, and spoken word. Thus, she is the voice of the Danegada. Tirfordi remained undiscovered for perhaps eons, until its discovery by a seafaring guild of sailors who call themselves the Knots. Comprised of expert navigators, the Knots ruled the waves that crashed on the beaches of the old continent, but not as naval combatants. Rather, they were a guild of nomadic mariners who lived and died sailing the open seas, often carrying out contract work for nations requiring freight and trade services on the old continent. While the Knots accepted volunteers to join their ranks, the guild was rather closed off as they generally looked for recruits as payment for a completed service, or amongst their passengers and the nations they represent regardless of who they were or where they came from. The Knots refer to their recruits as the Seaborn, one who was born on a Knot ship who is by law required to serve a life at sea with the guild, or Sea Gifted, one who is recruited to the guild at a young age. Sea Gifted are often an agreed upon a payment, even prior to a child's birth in exchange for a timed contract requiring the guild's services. A breach of this contract could result in the offender being scorned by the guild and permanently blacklisted from receiving its services in the future. The following consequences can be detrimental to an entity's maritime endeavors. Much of the open ocean and the lands that are dotted throughout can trace their discovery back to an expedition by the Knots, whose sole landed municipality exists on an island that serves as their capital port. Tierfordi's discovery was rather insignificant to them at the time, as it was believed that the island held no value, and the Knots were never particularly interested in colonization or settling new lands. Rather, the location of the island was sold to the Knots' closest ally at the time, the Congregation of Merchants. The Congregation of Merchants is an economic powerhouse of the Old World, made up of several federated city-states that are economically and politically unified, but functionally autonomous, ruled individually by merchant princes. These princes act as a representative for their state, wherein leaders are chosen to serve a council whose power is centralized in the current capital of the Congregation, the coastal city of Serene, which also happens to be the richest and most powerful state within the Federation. While the Council is meant to be an equal representation of all states within the Congregation, the reality is that the most prosperous and capable states have the greatest influence. Thus, a game of intrigue is always at play. Generally, this influence is exerted by the merchant princes who inherit their position with the expectation that they will further their state and their family's position amongst the rest of the congregation. Failure to do so often results in an ousting of the entire family and the appointment of a more capable house and dynasty from within any city-state within the congregation. First and foremost, the congregation is interested in the pursuit of economic development. It has evolved in such a hostile environment on the old continent that its focus on diplomatic and commercial exchanges may very well be what is keeping it alive. Because of their commercial entanglement and cooperation with the Knots, both entities often find themselves enforcing a strict attitude of complete neutrality in continental conflicts. As such, the members of the congregation do not necessarily field any standing army under normal circumstances. Rather, they employ military forces through a guild that exists within the Federation's borders, known as the Coin Guard, while the Knots handle the naval and maritime needs of the congregation. The Coin Guard are a mercenary guild founded within the borders of the congregation, but they do not hold any official allegiance to the congregation or any of its states. While a great deal of the Coin Guard's manpower does come from states within the congregation, the Guard's loyalty is solely to those who pay the most. However, the Coin Guard does have a unique relationship with the congregation as they allow for it to remain militarily risk-free, as it focuses on economic development in cooperation with the Knots. The Guard may be mercenaries, but they are often far more professional than any standing army fielded by any nation on the continent. Their symbiotic relationship with the congregation ensures their funding far beyond what is needed 
and are thus able to equip their instructors, bodyguards, assassins, and foot soldiers with a cutting-edge arsenal. With the presence of great capital, needless to say that the coin guard is rife with political actors and are more than susceptible to falling into conspiracy in pursuit of personal gain. Despite the congregation's deep political and economical ties with several factions across the old continent, their endeavors are often pursued in complete secrecy, particularly when the merchant princes seek to expand their power and influence across the congregation and political standings. The discovery of Tier 4D was nothing but a commodity to the knots, something that could be sold or traded for for something of greater value. And thus, that's what they did. The location of the island was sold to the congregation, who then embarked on a journey to colonize the island in complete secrecy. The Knots and the congregation repeatedly attempted to make landfall on the island, but constantly failed due to the magical reinforcement that the natives received. However, the congregation was determined, and launched several attempts until one was eventually successful. At this point, the congregation paid the Knots to keep their exploitations on the island, and the island itself, a secret. Upon the congregation's arrival on Tier 4D, Several cities were erected across the island to house workers, warehouses, refineries, and cargo ports to ferry goods back to the old continent. The terrain was torn open for mineral extraction, and forests were destroyed by logging operations. The skies were blackened by thick smoke, polluting the air around the cities. After the successful repulsion of the native tribes, a tragic truth had been revealed. The merchant princes were tyrannical at heart, and their cordial diplomatic attitude was simply a facade used to feign neutrality and political disinterest in light of greater powers. But among the weak, the people of Tier 4D became the hunted. The congregation was prepared to punish the natives for their disobedience. This world is slowing down. How can I fight it? Those of the Yek for D who survived the congregation were enslaved, forced to destroy the earth that they held sacred as their brothers and sisters gave their lives to defend those who were still free. The congregation's superior technology and rate of reinforcement was too much for the islanders, and all soon felt lost. The natives collectively gathered within the heart of the island, the volcano, the fiery soul, and prayed to the divine spirit that governed the laws of nature on Tier 4 D, a god that they call Anon Mil Frictimen. It is here that the divinity of the island truly became apparent. The natives received a miraculous second wind as the earth beneath them awoke with an arcane rage. Mysterious beasts, entangled with roots, antlers, wings, and tentacles, appeared from the depths of the island to defend its inhabitants. They called these creatures Nadaig, or Guardians. Their physical appearance is indicative of the biomes they arose to defend, almost as if a collective mind compelled the island's creatures to form a symbiotic warrior out of their flesh. But there is one guardian in particular who appears in the legends surrounding these tumultuous times on Tier 4 D. A guardian who is said to tower over the congregation's cities, who could crush a building beneath its feet. This was a guardian of wrath. A wrath that unleashed from the heart of the island that is the volcano. With the great eruption, a lava flow unlike any had ever seen was set forth on congregation cities. As if the molten rock itself was sentient, a flaming blood. The lava flow buried an entire city and everyone beneath it. 
in a region now known by the name Magasvar, the Vale of the Great Battle. A city that lay in the wake of the Guardian's devastation still stands, though in a greatly ruined state. All that is left of the city lies here, and this spot serves as a memorial to the natives and the great victory that they achieved here. Battle after battle, the congregation began to crumble under the impossible odds that they soon faced as the island and all life on it seemingly united as one to repel the invaders back into the sea. Each and every clan fought tooth and nail alongside the Guardians wielding their magical powers, driving the congregation forces to the coast. As their armies shattered, the nobles began to panic, seeking routes to flee the island and return to the continent. The desperate congregation forces attempted to slow the native advance by burning the land behind them. The momentum of the native force was unstoppable as they laid waste to each and every settlement in their path with one final destination before they achieved complete victory. The region known as the Shore of Tall Bones, given its name for the whale skeletons that lay across its beaches, is that one final congregation outpost, perched on granite cliffs overlooking the surrounding area. Today, we only know this location by the name given to it by the natives. The Ruins of Didri. Like the rest of the congregation cities on the island, this too was destroyed in spectacular fashion. After the native onslaught had concluded, only few had escaped the island with their lives. Much of the island was in such disrepair that the natives could no longer recognize what used to be the land they called home. In commemoration of their valiant efforts, these areas were granted new titles, adorning names that defined the events that happened there. What remained of the congregation on Tier for D was now out on the open ocean turned back with their tail between their legs. Shocked and embarrassed by their defeat, they ensured that the expedition and colonization in its entirety was kept secret. All who knew of what happened here were either killed in the conflict, paid to stay silent, or assassinated to prevent any revelation. The destruction of Tear for D and the enslavement of the native peoples is a stain that the congregation could never wash out. The Knots had not forgotten about what happened on Tier 4D, but were honor bound and contractually obligated to keep it all a secret. However, roughly a century after these events took place, the location of Tier 4D was yet again sold to a seafaring nation, this one by the name of the Bridge Alliance. In the current age, the Bridge Alliance is one of the most powerful nations on the continent, making up a union of states from the bridge region of Gakain. The Alliance boasts a scholarly culture and is often at the forefront of technological and societal innovation in their corner of the world. Their pursuit of knowledge and discovery led them to Tier 4D, where they became the first nation to officially return to the island since the congregation's apocalyptic collapse on the island, though they were internationally recognized as the first to colonize Tier 4D. On the eastern side of the island, the Bridge Alliance established a grand city to serve as the launch point for expeditions aimed to uncover the mysteries of Tier 4D, the city of Hikmet. Shortly after its founding, scholars, explorers, and doctors flocked to the region as the island's enchanting allure of its wilderness presented opportunities for the Bridge Alliance to keep and enhance its reputation as being a technological leader on the world stage, in addition to trying to find a cure for a disease known as the Malachor. Hikmet's development was quickly stifled, however, as the natives once again attempted to defend their home, fearing further exploitation by its invaders. Fears stoked by what happened a century ago, which at this point is nothing but a legend to the native peoples. In the current day, the native peoples and the Bridge Alliance are considered to be at war. Shortly after the arrival of the Bridge Alliance on Tier 4D, a new colonial power appeared on the opposite western side of the island a religious society by the name of Teleme, a nation who was locked in a seemingly perpetual war with the Bridge Alliance on the continent. Teleme can attribute much of its expansion to religious conversion and the subsequent conquest of those who refused to convert. According to the Bridge Alliance, this religious fervor is what started their war on the old continent. Teleme's colonization of Tier 4D was not pursued in spite of their enemy, however. You see, Teleme was founded by the followers of a figure named Saint Matthias, who is said to have taught his disciples how to magically manipulate light to serve their creator who they call the Enlightened. 
Telemé believes that Tier 4D resembles a mysterious island that St. Matthias discovered long ago, and that the island houses some form of religious redemption for their people, and a potential cure for the Malachor, a disease ravaging the old continent. The city of San Mateus was named after the saint, and deliberately built on the opposite end of the island, mirroring the Bridge Alliance's Hikmet. The city became a holy site in and of itself, as pilgrims from across the nation came to the city looking to follow in the footsteps of St. Mateus, as they believed through the text of St. Lucius that he spent the remainder of his life searching for meaning on the island. A third nation arrives on the island shortly after the founding of San Mateus. With its secrets still kept closely guarded, the Congregation of Merchants has returned to found the city of New Serene. The city was intended to be the representation of a new chapter in the congregation's history, serving as a beacon of trade, diplomatic exchange, and a step toward colonizing the unknown. It is here where the journey to finding a cure to the deadly disease that is the Malachor starts.